Hello, everyone, and welcome to NOAA's webinar series. This is Mike McGowan, and I will serve as moderator for this webinar. NOAA is very lucky to have so many dedicated volunteer experts who are willing to share their time and talent with the albinism community. The topic for this webinar is eye care issues for adults with albinism, and our presenter is uh, Dr. Stephen Goldman. Uh, Stephen Goldman, MD, is uh, Chief Ophthalmology at Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia, and Clinical Assistant Professor, Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Dr. Goldman received his medical training at the Medical College of Pennsylvania and was Chief Resident Ophthalmology at New York Medical College. Dr. Goldman is a member of the American Medical Association, American Academy of Ophthalmology, American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons, uh, Pennsylvania Medical Society and Philadelphia County Medical Society. Uh, Dr. Goldman also has been recognized uh, by best actors in uh, 07, 08, uh, 2009, 10, and 2011-2012. Dr. Goldman also has experience uh, treating persons with albinism. Before we get started, I want to say a couple of things about the GoToWebinar software. Along with the welcome screen and then the title screen, a menu was displayed when you logged on. Uh, you can minimize that menu by clicking on the orange arrow. The GoToWebinar software also uh, allows participants to ask questions using a chat feature, which can be found at the bottom of that menu. Uh, please feel free to type questions as they come up during the presentation. What I'm going to do is hold on to those questions at the end. I will pose them to Dr. Goldman and we'll get through as many of them as time allows. We anticipate that the presentation itself will be about 15 to 20 minutes, and we'll stay uh, and answer questions for 40, 45 minutes uh, or so. I'd also like to remind everyone that this webinar will be posted on NOAA's YouTube channel within a few days, so if you have to leave or have technical problems, uh, please uh, look for the recording on YouTube. And now, Dr. Goldman. Well, before I'd like to start, um, I'd like to thank both uh, Mike McGowan and especially Margaret Mary Campbell for inviting me to tonight's webinar. Um, I think this is an important topic that will be uh, hopefully helpful and then a little bit enlightening. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the fact that there are some misconceptions about the vision in albinotic eyes. Um, probably the biggest misconception that people have is that your vision will not change throughout your lifetime. Um, it's true that your vision will be somewhat limited by because of your albinotic state, but that doesn't mean that throughout your lifetime your vision won't worsen. And the reason why it can worsen is that there are many things that change within the eye as the eye ages, whether you're albinotic or not. So to help understand uh, some of these things, let's talk about the eye, the aging eye, and albinism. So to understand about the eye, you need to know a little about the anatomy of the eye. To the right of this picture is the front of the eye, what we refer to as the anterior segment. And that consists of a number of different organelles. And in front of that is what we refer to as the external eye. The external eye consists of the lids and the eyelashes. And so let's talk about those a little bit. The eyelids provide protection to the globe. They spread the tear film and rewet the cornea. Um, in ocular albinism, as you know, there's a decreased amount of skin pigmentation. The lashes are usually found on a small, thin strip of tissue. And there's one to three rows of lashes. They're usually fine. And the idea behind these are to catch foreign bodies before they go in the eye. In a normal eye, the lashes can range from blonde to quite dark. In albinotic eyes, they're usually white to lightly pigmented. The anterior segment of the eye consists of the conjunctiva, which is a thin, transparent mucous membrane. It provides a lubrication to the eye surface. So when the eye moves, this smooth uh, mucous membrane allows the eye to move smoothly and not get caught as it would be if it was a little stickier. The cornea is a clear dome-shaped membrane. It has five different layers. On the surface it's called the epithelium and on the inside surface it's called the endothelium. And this is the primary source of the focusing power of the eye. It's transparent and as I said dome-shaped so it sits in front of the eye. Through the eye, when you look into someone's eye, you see their anterior chamber. It's a fluid-filled chamber. It's optically neutral, and it's just basically filled with a fluid to bathe the internal contents of the front of the eye with a nutrient fluid so that the avascular, meaning no blood vessel, area of the eye can see well. 
the anterior chamber has the iris floating in it. The iris consists of muscle, stroma, and blood vessels. Its job in life is to decrease or increase the amount of light depending on how much light is out in the eye. So when you're out on a bright sunny day, the pupil should get small to decrease the amount of light getting in the eye. And when you go into dim illumination, the pupil dilates to allow more light in when there's less light available. The color is actually dependent on the melanin. A common misconception in the public is that there's blue pigment and brown pigment, hazel pigment, or green. In fact, there's only one color of pigment, and it's brown. And the color of the eye is dependent on how much melanin you have. So your pupil, uh, excuse me, your iris will appear blue. If you have a lot of pigment, it'll be deeply brown. And if it's somewhere in between, it might be hazel, gray, or green. In ocular albinism, the eye is typically blue or gray in color and has transillumination defects. It allows much too light to enter the eye, and so it doesn't do quite as good a job, which is responsible for why many patients with albinism are so sensitive to the light. In this picture you see in front of you, you'll see a typical albinotic looking eye. There's a blue iris. Um, you can see uh, in sort of fine detail lots of stromal um, detail that you don't see in a brown eye. The, eye. the eyelashes here are quite light color. They're almost blonde or almost white. In the next picture, we use a technique called transillumination. Transillumination allows the light to bounce through the front pupil, bounce off the retina, and then light up the iris from behind. Now, in a normal iris, when that happens, the light gets blocked by the pigment on the back part of your iris. Since in an albinotic eye there's no pigment there, the iris lights up. And the orangey, reddish color that you see in the peripheral iris is representative of the blood vessels of the iris itself. The iris has a lot of blood vessels. When you go onto the lens, the lens is shaped a little bit like an M&M candy. It's clear. It has a surface membrane around it called the capsule. It's very flexible, especially when you're young. That flexibility decreases as we age, which is why people end up needing reading glasses or bifocals as they age. The light, the, looks the lens of your eye, is the sole source of the variable focusing power to the eye. It allows your eye to see far away and up close all at once. The posterior segment of the eye consists of the vitreous gel, the retina, and the optic nerve. The vitreous gel is a blob of jelly. It, it's about 80% of the entire eye's volume is taken up by this blob of jelly. It doesn't do much except allow light to pass through it uninterrupted to the retina. So we call it optically empty. The retina has nine layers. It has three central zones. The central most zone is called the macula, with the most important part of the macula being the fovea. A mid-periphery zone and then the far periphery of the retina are much less important to your vision. It converts light energy coming from distant objects, and it turns it into a chemical energy. And that chemical reaction then turns into electrical energy, which is sent off to your brain. Here's a picture of a typical normally pigmented retina. You notice on the right-hand side, there is a almost donut-shaped uh, organelle, and that's your optic nerve. And emanating from that are blood vessels. You'll see both retinal arteries and retinal veins. To the left of that, you'll see an orange spot in the middle. That orange spot is the fovea. And surrounding the fovea between the blood vessels above and below is the area we refer to as the macula. In OCA, you have macular hypoplasia, or more specifically, foveal hypoplasia. And the retina appears what is what's referred to in ophthalmology as a blonde fundus, meaning very, very, very lightly pigmented. In this picture, you'll see a typical albinotic uh, retinal photograph. And you'll see a tangle of spaghetti-like blood vessels, many more than we saw in the prior picture. And I'm going to go back to that picture for a second just to show you what it looks like. So when we go back to this picture, you'll see this tangled spaghetti-like pattern. And the blood vessels you're seeing there are actually blood vessels from below the retina called the choroid. And normally, you don't see the choroid because you have a pigmented layer of cells called the retinal pigment epithelium that separates the retina from these blood vessels. And since there is no pigment there, you can see right through this as if it's invisible and see these blood vessels. The optic nerve, which I showed you in that prior picture, has about 1.2 million nerve fiber layers, and they go connect into the brain in various ways. They transmit the light energy to well, the bioelectrical energy down through the optic nerve through what's called the optic chiasm off to the brain. So how does your eye age? The eye ages in a couple different ways. We'll start with the external eye. Um, your eyelids can get heavier. They can get boggier, and they can droop. Lid droop, the medical term for that is ptosis, can cause quite a bit of blurry vision when patients don't realize that that's the cause. Um, it's not as obvious as something of the cataracts or macular degeneration. 
the droop lid often is more symptomatic when patients are reading. As the eye ages and it's bathed in UV light from the sun, you can develop tumors in the lid. And finally, the external eye produces tears, and as the tear production decreases, as it does to most patients as they age, a lack of good tear production can not only make the eye uncomfortable, but can make your vision blurry. The anterior segment, you can get development to generations of the conjunctiva, again from UV light, corneal deposition, particularly cholesterol, and then finally cataracts. Now cataracts are the aging of the lens. Typically, I tell most of my patients, if you live long enough, you're going to get a cataract. And long enough in most patients is between 55 and 60. The cataract consists of an enlarging lens that loses its clarity and certainly loses its flexibility. So one of the first complaints patients have about their aging lens is the fact that they need those bifocal glasses to help them read. The loss of clarity requires increasing light as you age, and the enlarging size can cause glaucoma. In an ocular cutaneous albinism, the cataracts are often of the nuclear sclerotic type. They turn very dense, they become very brown, and they can be quite underestimated by the ophthalmologist. Patients who have had their cataracts removed after being told by doctor after doctor that it won't help can be surprised at how dramatically improved their vision is. Now here's a picture that's maybe a little difficult to understand unless you've seen the eye, but to the left you'll see kind of an arc, and that's your cornea. And then to the right, you'll see the lens of your eye. And it's kind of a brownish color. You'll see it's almost kind of like football shaped in a vertical fashion. And that brownish shape is the nuclear sclerosis, the darkening of the center of the lens, which is called the nucleus. So what do we do for cataracts? Well, early on, oftentimes just changing the glasses is good enough. We'll tell patients to use stronger lights to avoid certain environments where the lights bother them. But later on, cataract surgery and then secondary lens implantation is the way to go. The posterior segment of the eye, again, can age as well. Um, many patients have described floaters, which are a little bit of debris. And then later on, as the vitreous continues to degenerate, as does other parts of the eye, it'll pull away from the retina. And that separation away from the retina can cause flashes of light and a dramatic increase in the number of floaters. It's usually a benign event, but occasionally 2% of patients, in about 2% of patients, the retina will tear. Um, that will require further treatment to prevent a retinal detachment. In the retina, there are typically maybe three or four different ways things go bad. Diabetic retinopathy is the second most common cause of blindness in the United States. About 5,000 patients a year go blind from their diabetes, damaging their retina. But the, by and far away, the leading cause of blindness in the Western world, not just the United States, is age-related macular degeneration. You can develop stroke or a venous stroke. And then finally, the retina, as I said earlier, can detach. In diabetes, the retina blood vessels become leaky. They start to leak blood. They leak water, which can result in bleeding directly into the retina or swelling of the retina, here referred to as macular edema, and can cause blurred vision. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy is a more severe variety of diabetic retinopathy. This occurs when new blood vessels grow into the area of the retina that's not served well by the current blood vessels that have been damaged by the diabetes. And those blood vessels can bleed significantly, causing a vitreous hemorrhage. And they can pull off the retina by tearing it with these new blood vessels. It is a severe loss of vision is associated with either of the retinal detachment or the vitreous hemorrhage. In age-related macular degeneration, it tends to run in families. So if mom had it or dad had it or your grandparents had it, you have a higher chance of developing it. Um, it's associated with people who smoked, even if you smoked many years ago and stopped, increased lipids, meaning your cholesterol or your um, uh, other blood fats are high, and high blood pressure itself or hypertension. There are two main types. There's the dry and the wet type. The dry occurs when the retina just degenerates, and the wet type occurs when new blood vessels grow underneath the retina. The optic nerve has its share of problems as well, and glaucoma being probably the most well-known, temporal arteritis and non-ischemic optic neuropathy being two others. In glaucoma, the eye pressure tends to rise, and when it goes up, it can cause a progressive painless loss of vision. This increased pressure damaging the optic nerve is often asymptomatic early on and may take years, even a decade or more, before the patient becomes symptomatic. By that point, it's quite late in the course, which is why routine eye exams are very important. We can treat that by lowering the pressure with either drops or by surgeries. Temporal arteritis, <clears throat> sometimes referred to as giant cell arteritis, occurs as you get older, so you have to be in your 60s or older typically. It's often more, found, <clears throat> excuse me, more commonly found 
in patients who are uh, Caucasian. It's a little bit more common in women than men. It's caused by an inflammation of the blood vessels throughout your entire body, and it can cause an infarct or a stroke of the optic nerve. It can also kill you by causing either a stroke in the brain or ultimately heart attacks. The treatment of choice of that is using steroids. Not ischemic optic of the eye, but it occurs because of atherosclerosis, meaning hardening of the arteries, feeding the optic nerve, and this is again associated with typical things you see with hardening of the arteries, smoking, hypertension, and in the eye's case, also farsightedness. There's no treatment available to this, and when it does occur, unfortunately, it's usually a quick, painless loss of vision that's quite significant. So that kind of wraps up uh, an overview of the eye. So I'm open to questions if anybody has any. Well, thank you, uh, Doctor. Um, one of the uh, issues that uh, you touched on was uh, cataracts, and a number of individuals with, albin individuals with, albinism, with albinism in our community have had to deal with uh, cataracts. Um, and one of the issues that comes up when we, uh, a person with albinism goes in for cataract surgery is that they need to uh, – they need to uh, – hi, doctor. Hello? Can you hear me, doctor? Doc Hello? Doctor, can you hear me? Uh, I can now. I lost you for a second. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I, I got you when a number of patients – and then you kind of – I lost you. Okay. Can you hear me now? I, I can hear you well, yes. Okay, because I just got a message that I had lost the uh, connection. Um, the The issue is that when we go in for the cataract surgery, because of our nystagmus, it's difficult to get a measurement for the lens. Uh, how How would you How do you, would you recommend that a patient with albinism deal with that with their ophthalmologist? Well, that, that's a great question. One of, the, one of the problems you have with anybody who has poor vision is that you need them to hopefully fixate on a specific object so that we can use various different techniques to measure certain parameters around the eye. We need to know the curvature of the cornea. We need to know the length of the eye from the front of the eye to the back of the eye. We need to know the front of the eye to other uh, portions of the eye. And then we use those, that information and we can plug it into computerized formulas which help us determine what implant to put in the eye. And when we talk about what type of implant, we're not talking about the brand, we're talking about the power. So the power is key because what we're trying to do here is lower your um, prescription as much as we can. And so it's always difficult in any patient to get an accurate fixation if they can't fixate for you. So it doesn't matter whether this is albinism or a person who has, let's say, macular degeneration who can't fixate either. But one of the things we can do when someone has nystagmus is there's often what we refer to as the null point, which is that there's usually a position you can get the person to look at where the nystagmus dampens down quite a bit. Now, the technology I use in my office um, utilizes something called the IOL master, or, uh, which is a machine that uses a laser light to measure the distance from various parts of the eye, the front of the cornea to the retina, the front of the cornea to the lens. And that machine has a ability to, even with, the, with poor fixation, to get us a fairly accurate number. Having said that, small errors can lead to large prescription changes in the glasses. Um, when we're dealing with someone with albinism, we want to get that as tight as possible. However, we do realize that you're likely to need glasses after the fact. So if it is a, a small amount off, that can be taken care of quite easily by providing a prescription glass that will cover that, that change. Uh, during, that, uh, <clears throat> during that question, I used the term nystagmus, and someone has asked, what is nystagmus, and does it occur because of albinism, and is there a treatment? So I'm going to answer the first two of those, doctor, if you don't mind. And, uh, you no, no, no problem. You can handle the third. Uh, nystagmus is the involuntary uh, movement of the eye that is associated with albinism, uh, and it is it does occur because of albinism. It's one uh, it it occurs in most patients with albinism. Again, Mike. 
I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Right. Yep. I got you again. Okay. I, I'm the, the uh, uh, nystagmus is uh, something that happens in most patients with albinism. And as far as the treatment factor, well, there's there's no specific treatment for albinism. Uh, excuse me for nystagmus. Um, you know, fortunately for most patients, early in life, uh, the nystagmus will slowly dampen as they age. And as I said earlier, you can sort of find a null point. Patients will know to turn their head slightly or to look down a little bit, and it sort of dampens the oscillations of the eyes as they move back and forth. Um, albinism, you know, nystagmus is not unique to albinism. You can get that with any condition that uh, occurs, especially early in life, that decreases the quality of vision. Um, there is a cross-eyed condition in patients called congenital esotropia, and it's very common one eye that the patients will develop nystagmus. Uh, patients with um, congenital issues of blockage of light to the eye, such as congenital cataracts, may often develop nystagmus. It's more of a function of poor uh, vision to the brain early in life than it is to specific to OCI. Uh, you know, I, I want to just uh, insert one real quick um, uh, note here. You know, I mentioned at the beginning that there was a a chat feature, but it's actually, it says questions, and most of you have all figured that out because you're using the right one. Uh, the next question is, at last, uh, at, at the NOAA conference last summer, uh, I heard a presentation talk about implants that have correction for nearsightedness and farsightedness and even astigmatism. Are these an option for those with albinism? Well, uh, you can certainly use an astigmatism lens or, or what would I, I would call a regular lens, which is a spherical lens, but I would not use a restore or a crystal lens in a patient with albinism. Those lenses are designed for uh, allowing you to see both distant and near uh, without the need for glasses, and especially the what we refer to as multifocal lenses. Uh, those lenses require essentially a totally normal eye. You can't have diabetes, you can't have glaucoma, um, you can't have uh, macular degeneration because you need to have actually quite exquisite visual potential to use those lenses, uh, in large part because those lenses only use a, a portion of the vision at any one point. In other words, they only focus 60% of the distance light to begin with, and if you already have an eye that has less than the best visual potential, putting that lens in would uh, certainly not help you and actually would hinder you quite a bit. Um, a spherical lens or a toric lens, the difference between the two of those is sort of the difference between a basketball and a football. If you have a basketball shaped eye, you want a basketball lens, and we call those spherical lenses. And if you have a football shaped eye, and this is all based typically on the cornea, if your cornea is football shaped, you need a football shape to counteract that football shape, and so we use a toric lens for that. You don't have to use a toric implant, however. You could use a regular implant and correct the astigmatism with glasses again. Um, so either of those ways uh, can go about it, but I would definitely not use something that would be referred to as a multifocal lens, someone with OCA. Okay, next one is uh, one of our uh, participants tonight was, uh, was told once that glaucoma was caused by pigment, pigment plugging up the tear ducts, and since people with albinism don't have pigment in the eye, we wouldn't get, get glaucoma. Is that true? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure any of that was true, actually. Um, glaucoma is a disease where the eye pressure goes, becomes elevated, and it damages the optic nerve. And everybody's optic nerve has a slightly different potential. If you have a very hardy optic nerve, maybe a slightly higher pressure would be okay. And if you have a particularly weak optic nerve, even a normal pressure may be too high. Um, so it's not just the pressure, it's also how your eye relates to your, your given pressures. But glaucoma occurs in, in quite you know, two fashions. There's something called narrow angle glaucoma, which is where the fluid in the eye can't even reach the drain. That acutely happens, and it happens typically in far-sighted patients with big cataracts. So you yeah, typically have to be a little older and be very far-sighted to be even eligible for that. Um, that's uncommon in this country. Uh, the more common cause of glaucoma is called open-angle glaucoma, where the fluid in the eye does reach the drain of the eye or the angle of the eye, but the angle of the eye is inefficient. The drain's clogged, and it's, it's probably 
too simplistic to say it's just pigment that got into the drain that caused it because you can have a minimally pigmented drain and have terrible glaucoma and have a very pigmented drain and have a normal pressure. So it's more than just the pigment, it's just the drain doesn't work well. Um, I tell my patients often think of it as a plumbing issue. You have a, a drain in your sink and it's an old drain and fluid gunk builds up in that drain and the fluid doesn't get out quite as well. And when we treat glaucoma, we either reduce the fluid going into the eye or we try to increase the speed of the fluid getting out of the eye. Um, it really doesn't have much to do with the tear duct. The tear duct's on the surface of the eye and really doesn't play a role in glaucoma. The tear duct is more uh, related to dry eyes and or tearing, not uh, elevated eye pressure. Um, and then to can patients with uh, ocular cutaneous albinism develop glaucoma? Absolutely. If your eye pressure goes up, and you can get it. It's, it's not related specifically to pigment, although there is one rare type of glaucoma called uh, pigmentary glaucoma, and that's extremely uncommon. Um, so that might be the one type of glaucoma you couldn't get. Is there any reason a person with albinism might be any more susceptible to a, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, I think I lost you again. Yeah, I, there you go, I got you back. Okay, am I back? Am I back? Am I back? Whoa. Hello, hello. Uh, oh, bear with me, bear with me. Hello, 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 hello. Stay with me, please. Hello. Hello, am I back? Yep, you're back now. Okay, I'm sorry about this, folks. Um, okay. Is there any reason a person with albinism might be any more susceptible to any of the conditions mentioned in the presentation than anyone else? Uh, well, absolutely. Um, you know, starting from the external part of your eye, the fact that there's less pigment to the skin of the face and certainly the eyelids, uh, you are much more prone to developing damage from the UV rays of the sun. So basal cell carcinomas, uh, melanomas, and squamous cell carcinomas of the eyelids are certainly much more likely to occur in someone with albinism than if you don't. Um, and that's why wearing UV protecting sunglasses, uh, hats are, are very, very important, obviously, to prevent that. Um, the iris is designed to reduce the amount of light going back into the eye, and so uh, eyes with albinism are bathed in way more light than the average person for their entire lives. And that light, I believe, is somewhat toxic, especially to the lens of the eye. That's uh, my belief why the cataracts in, in the patients that I've operated on have been typically much harder, and I mean not harder, more difficult to remove, but denser lenses than uh, the average person of that age. So I think that's a, a clear sign. Um, I haven't really seen uh, an increase in macular degeneration, and in my research I haven't really seen that, but you would certainly expect that, you know, potentially more macular degeneration. Um, I just don't think that's happened quite as much. Um, and that may be because of the protective nature of the fact that the retina, as it's hypoplastic, meaning it's not quite as metabolically active, can handle the uh, blood supply changes as you get older and therefore the light. So I think the two big changes would be skin cancer on the eyelids, and increasing cataracts. Uh, this is uh, an, an interesting question that comes up, and I don't mean to put you on the spot on this one, but uh, do, you first, do you foresee any stem cell research being applicable? Uh, or of uh, Well, you know what? I, I certainly don't do bench research myself, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I definitely foresee that at some point there will be a, uh, some gene research that will come out at some point. I don't know whether I'll live to see it. Um, certainly when I was a medical student, that was going to be, and that was a fair number of years ago, um, that was going to be the most of man's medical illnesses, and it seems like that quite hasn't lived up to be the case at this point. But it would not shock me if at some point we do have uh, the ability to um, see some stem cell research helping patients with all sorts of medical conditions, including OCA. There is a group at the University of Pennsylvania that have worked on uh, using stem cells to treat a, a completely different disease, and they're actually somewhat successful um, in very early clinical trials. So be the case, but I think it's going to be a long time coming. I've heard that eye exercises can help vision. Is that true? No, not at all. 
Um, the you, moving your eyes up or down, left or right, you know, might make you feel a little better. Um, it can be quite relaxing to some patients. Um, I have uh, actually a yoga instructor as a patient, and she you know, swears by it as, as a way of relieving stress and uh, centering um, yourself. But I don't think it really will do much to improve vision. I think that comes about because when children are young and they have one eye that's not working quite as well, they refer to that as a lazy eye. And kind of the lay way we explain that to patients is we patch one eye to make the other eye work harder. In other words, exercise that eye. And in fact, you're really not exercising the eye that you're exercising. What you are exercising is the connections between the eye and the brain. Because in young children, those connections haven't quite solidified. But by the time you're seven to eight years of age, they have solidified. So you want to catch those kids early, which is why we do a lot of vision screening on children. Um, but exercising the eye will not strengthen your eye, especially once you've you know, reached adulthood. Would LASIK help a person with albinism? Yeah, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it would help with albinism, as, you know, as it would not help patients who don't have albinism. I don't think it makes a difference one way or the other. Uh, let's see. Um, um, I, I, I'm not sure that I'm going to read this. I'm not sure that I understand it completely. Uh, couldn't a person with albinism benefit from replacing replacing my currently non-cataract eye lens with a similarly powered eye lens? and then no longer need either contact lenses or eyeglass vision correction because it would be corrected internally. Has this ever done before cataracts? Uh, um, it is. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure anybody's done that in someone with albinism, but they have done it. It's um, called refractive lens exchange. And, you know, as you go through life, the lens of your eye becomes a cataract. They are the same thing. A large, stiff, cloudy lens is a cataract. And so the choice of the timing, I should say, the timing of when you replace that lens depends on what your options are and what your, I guess, what your objectives are. When you replace the lens in an aged eye, you're replacing it because you clearly have lost vision because of the opacification of the lens, the cloudiness of the lens does not allow a normal light path to the back of the eye. In a younger patient who's looking to maybe eliminate their glasses and or contact lenses, you're doing it for refractive reasons. You're not doing it because they can't see. They see fine with their current glasses or contacts. You're replacing it so that they can get rid of their glasses. And so you could do that in someone with albinism, but I'm not sure that would make that much of a difference as to the quality of your vision. Um, the dramatic improvement I've seen in the patients I've operated on with cataract surgery have resulted because you've removed the cloudiness of the lens as opposed to just putting the lens in the eye to replace the glasses or the contacts. So yes, it's done. It's done throughout the country. Um, it's not done very frequently. Most ophthalmologists do not uh, do that um, for a number of reasons. One is, you know, whenever we do a surgical procedure, we have to weigh the risks of the procedure against the benefits of the procedure. And someone who's lost vision and that you cannot improve it with glasses or contact lenses, there's a clear advantage to doing the cataract surgery which typically outweighs the risks of the operation. And someone who sees fine or at their best with glasses or contacts, by replacing the lens, you, the risks seem a little bit higher um, in regards to the improvement, meaning just I can, don't have to wear glasses or contacts. For most uh, patients who want to get rid of their glasses or contacts, they do something along the lines like uh, LASIK or PRK, which are techniques which change the shape of the cornea which has its own risks, but are less risky than, let's say, doing cataract surgery. So I'm not sure I would recommend that, um, but it's certainly an option. I've had some patients uh, ask me about it, and you know, typically after we've talked about the pros and cons, they will all turn around and say, you know, I'm not that interested anymore. This is an interesting question. I often tell people that my sight is reduced uh, as if I have less pixels to receive light. Is that correct? Is that a correct analogy? Do people with albinism have less light receptors? Okay, did you lose me again? Hello. 
Uh, hello. I'm here. Okay. Did you get that last question, Doctor? I, I did not. Okay. The, uh, the question is, is that the, uh, this individual with albinism tells people that uh, the reason that they have poor vision is they have less light receptors. Is that true? Hello? Uh, hello, Doctor. I'm sorry again. That's okay. Um, so you didn't get the question again? I did not. Okay, the, this individual with albinism explains to people that the reason that his vision is uh, poor is that he has less light receptors than a normal eye. Is that a correct analogy? I think that's pretty close to being as good as you're going to give somebody uh, an answer. Uh, you know, when we talk about foveal hypoplasia, think of sort of a, a typical target that you would have when you're um, shooting an arrow or, or shooting a, a gun off. and there's a centered uh, target, and then there's a, a ring around that, and another ring around that, and another ring around that. In the eye, the very center target is called the fovea. And the fovea is very small. It's a millimeter or so in size. And that's where you have your best potential of vision. As you move further away from that center vision, you have less good quality vision. This is in any normal patient, a normal eye patient. And as you move further away, you get worsening and worsening vision. So ultimately, you don't have to go very far where you can go from 20-20 vision to 2080 to 2200 vision, which is the legal definition of blindness in the United States. And it, it, it is not a very large area. And in the area that we're talking about, the foveal hypoplasia that you see in means that typically most patients in that category might have at best 2100, 2200 vision because there just aren't the receptors there that they should be there. Um, I, I, uh, I just want to make uh, clear because, you know, sometimes reading the questions and listening to the answers is somewhat difficult. Um, I just want to clear up um, the, this, this question of the susceptibility. Hello. Again, Mike. Hello. 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 Can you hear me now? Hello? All right, am I back? You're back. Okay. I am sorry, folks, for the inconvenience. Um, just to, so that we're clear on this question about macular degeneration, um, to, to put it in, an, in a nutshell, is a person with albinism any less uh, susceptible to macular degeneration? Some of our uh, participants today have been told that they cannot get macular degeneration because of their albinism? Uh, I'm not sure that there's a definitive answer to that question. I don't think I, could, I would say to anybody, you have no risk of developing macular degeneration. I think if you um, have the, you know, a, a poor health history, you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you have a bad family history, um, you're a smoker, you know, you may not develop macular degeneration in the typical way that perhaps a, a person without albinism would because you don't have the, you know, one of the things that we think happens in macular degeneration is that the retinal pigment epithelial cells um, die off and they don't provide the nutrition for the overlying retina. And in the case of an albinotic patient, they don't really have an RPE that works as well. Um, and so they may not be as dependent on that. But I suspect that you can lose vision. It just may not look like a person who has normal pigmentation would look when they get that. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I could quite answer that, and I'm not sure that um, I've seen a whole lot of research that's talked about macular degeneration one way or the other, um, and I did look um, because that question was asked to me several times, and I've not been able to find anything that really goes into great detail as to macular degeneration. Part of the problem is there are just not that many patients. When we talk about macular degeneration in the United States, um, you know, we think that ultimately 40% of the population will ultimately develop some amount of macular degeneration if they live to 90. Um, but, you know, we're talking tens of millions of patients, and there's just not that kind of volume of uh, patient population to do studies on in, in the uh, OCA population. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldman. This, I think, has been a good presentation. I, I trust you can still hear me? I can. Okay. Um, it's been my pleasure.
I think that, uh, you know, we're about the time that I said we were going to be. And just as a reminder to those uh, listening to the webinar, uh, this webinar will be posted on uh, NOAA's YouTube channel within the next few days. Uh, please keep an eye out for email announcements for new webinars and teleconferences. And I suggest that you check NOAA's website for future events such as uh, things going on in your area. Um, NOAA's 15th National Conference is going to be held next uh, a year uh, from next month, July 10th to 13th, uh, 2014 in San Diego, California. And our adult weekend is uh, coming up in September of this year. Uh, September 6th to 8th, and it will be in Portland, Oregon. Again, thank you very kindly, uh, Dr. Goldman, for your time, and thanks, everyone, for participating this evening. You're welcome. Have a great night.